Welcome to Math TV with Professor V. In this video, we're going to go over analysis of variance, ANOVA, from chapter 16 for introductory statistics. And to kick things off, we're going to start with section 16.1 on the F distribution. So the F distribution is a new distribution that we're going to be working with. Up until now, we've worked with the normal Z distribution, T distribution, and chi-square. So the F distribution, where does it come from? When two independent samples are selected from two normally distributed populations with equal variances and their sample variances are compared as a ratio, the sampling distribution takes the form of the F distribution. So basically, it comes from taking the sample variances, their ratio, okay, from these two populations that meet the conditions listed above. So some characteristics to keep in mind about the F distribution. First and foremost, the values of F cannot be negative since variances are always positive or zero. So remember, the F distribution values come from the ratio of the sample variances, and those are both quantities squared, right? S squared is variance. So that's why values of F never going to be negative. Second characteristic is that the F distribution is positively or right skewed. Notice just one sample little curve right here skewed to the right. Third characteristic is that the mean value of F is approximately equal to one. And then much like chi-square, the F distribution is a family of curves based on degrees of freedom of the numerator and denominator. And it's also right skewed like the chi-square distribution. So when you're dealing with the F distribution though, it'll uh, list the degrees of freedom and then you would have an ordered pair next to it. The first um, entry in that ordered pair is the degrees of freedom for the numerator, and then the second one is the degrees of freedom for the denominator, okay? And later when we get into stat crunch, I'll show you exactly how to figure those out. Um, we won't use a table, there's a calculator, okay? All right, so that's enough about the F distribution. Now we're going to go into what is one-way ANOVA, what's the logic behind it, okay? So if you'll think back, in chapter 10, we studied how to compare two population means, and we talked about using a pooled and a non-pooled T procedure. So we could set up confidence intervals or perform hypothesis tests. So now what we want to do is basically take that same idea but expand it so we can look at more than two population means at a time. And the way that we do that is using a one-way analysis of variance. And that's generalizing to more than two populations our pooled T procedure that we're pretty familiar with. And it allows us to compare the means of a variable for populations that result from a classification by one other variable called a factor. And the possible values of the factor are referred to as levels of the factor. Now, I know that's a lot of vocab. It might seem really weird right now. So let me just give you an example of a situation from your book to help put some context to all this terminology, okay? So say, for example, you wanna compare the mean energy consumption by households among the four regions of the United States. So the variable that's under consideration is energy consumption, okay? That's what we're measuring. And there's going to be four populations, households in the Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. So these four populations result from classifying households in the U.S. based on the factor of their region, okay? And then there are four levels. The levels are being Northeast, the levels being Northeast, Midwest, South, and West, okay? And we'll go through some examples so you can see Basically, you're comparing the means from these four regions with one another. And our assumptions or conditions for one-way ANOVA coincide with those for when we performed a pooled T procedure, which makes sense because this is essentially the same test, just generalized for more than two populations. So first assumption is we need simple random samples. That's no surprise. 
Second one is that we need independent samples. So these are not paired um, data samples. Normal populations and equal standard deviations. Remember, we don't necessarily need to know what those population standard deviations are, but if we can reasonably assume that they're approximately equal, then the conditions are met. And ANOVA comes from analysis of variance. So I want you to know where that abbreviation or acronym comes from. Analysis of, there's the O, variance, the, okay? Good. So now let's look at, we're already in 16.3, look at that. How to set up a one-way ANOVA. So we're just gonna be performing hypothesis tests right now. State the mean and alternative hypotheses. So the null we know always involves equality. And in this case, if you think back to your pooled T procedure, we would always say mu1 equals mu2 or mu1 minus mu2 is zero, right? But we perform ANOVA when we have more than two populations. So you could have three or more. And the null is always assuming that all of those means are equal to each other, okay? So for the alternative hypothesis, be careful. Think, what would it take for the null to not be true? What would it take for this to be a false statement? Well, if one of those mu's, just one, is not equal to the rest, the null hypothesis would be false. Or maybe two of them aren't equal to the rest. Or maybe they're all different from one another. So there's a lot of ways that the null hypothesis could be rejected or be incorrect. And typically we don't sit there and list every single option for the alternative. Instead, what we just say is at least one mean is different from the others. Okay. And that basically summarizes all of the possibilities that would make the null hypothesis not true. So if you were to compute your test statistic by hand, the procedure would be as follows. For each group, you would compute the average. So you, say we're looking at this example here with the energy consumption in the four regions. I would have an average sample mean for each of these four regions. So you would have X1 bar, X2 bar, X3 bar, like that, X4 bar. So since we're not specifying how many populations, we're just gonna say we have XI bar, and then you need the variance for each of those. And then here's how you compute, oh, and the grand mean, excuse me. The grand mean, sounds so fancy, huh? It's X bar, sometimes we abbreviate with a little subscript GM to indicate it's the grand mean, and it's the sum of all of the sample values divided by N. Capital N is the uh, sum of all the sample sizes. Okay, now you do need to know how to compute degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom for the numerator is k minus 1, and degrees of freedom for the denominator is n minus k. n, capital N, is the sum of the sample sizes, and k is the number of groups, okay? So for the previous example here, there were four groups, right, four regions, and then I don't know what the size of each of the samples were. I don't have specifics, but if I were to add them all up, that would give me capital N. I'm gonna work through an example in StatCrunch and show you how to do this. After that step, you would find the between group variance, which we indicate with S, a little B subscript for between group squared. I think your book uses slightly different notation but basically this is the sum of n sub i, those are the sizes of each of the samples, x bar minus grand mean squared over the sum n sub i minus one. That's the variance between the groups. And then here we're gonna also compute the variance within the groups. So that would be the sum n sub i minus one that's the variance within each group, sum n sub i minus one. You don't need to worry about using these formulas. And then from there, you get the test value for one-way ANOVA, which is an F test. 
and you take the between group variance and you divide it by the within group variance. So that's basically what I wanted you to get out of this is the values of f are not going to be negative because it's the ratio of these two variances, which we know won't be negative either. And degrees of freedom are k minus 1 for the numerator and then n minus k for the denominator. That's pretty much it. From there, you use alpha to determine the critical value or find the p-value and then make a decision and summarize. And I did want to point out your book um, calls or writes the alternative hypothesis just a wee bit different than what I showed you. So the assumptions are the same. The null is the same. But the alternative, they say not all the means are equal. That's pretty much the same as saying at least one mean is different. It means the same thing. Okay. And then they just use a little bit different notation to show how to compute F. Um, you don't need to worry about knowing what MSTR, MSER, or anything like that for this class. But I did want to show you using this ratio instead of what the book shows, because now you can see how it's a ratio of variances, which is why the F values are never negative. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to show you some examples now in StatCrunch, and we're done. How exciting. Okay, just to warm up, I wanted to show you how to compute the degrees of freedom. So this question says, suppose that a one-way ANOVA is being performed to compare the means of six populations and that the sample sizes are 16, 11, 12, 18, 14, and 14. Determine the degrees of freedom for the F statistic. So remember, degrees of freedom of the numerator we list first, and that's equal to k minus 1. So k minus 1 is going to be, remember, k represents the number of groups, right, or populations, minus 1. So how many populations? There's 6. So 6 minus 1 is 5. Then I need degrees of freedom for the denominator, which is capital N minus K. Capital N is the sum of all of the sample sizes. So I'm going to add up 16 plus 11 plus 12 plus 18 plus 14 plus 14. So that gives me 85. That's capital N. And then I'm going to subtract K, which is number of populations or groups, which is 6. So 85 minus 6 gives me 79. And then put the parentheses, you guys, so you don't get the answer wrong, even though the numbers are correct. Okay, good. The rest of the homework is a lot of conceptual questions, and then there are hypothesis tests. So let's get into that. Let's redo this one. Let's do a more exciting one. Yeah, okay, because we talked about this one anyways, right? About the, the four regions. So independent random samples of newly completed apartments in four regions of a country yielded the data on monthly rents in dollars given to the right. How many, are these just studio apartments? Because I don't know where you would pay rent so low. Okay, at the 1% significance level, do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that a difference exists in mean monthly rents among newly completed apartments in four regions? So the four regions are Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. And here's the rent. Oh my goodness. Okay. So what are the correct hypotheses? Remember, we say all of the means are equal for the null. And then for the alternative, not none of the means are equal, not all of them. At least two of the means are equal. No, not all the means are equal, okay? They worded that in a little bit of a confusing way, but we're good. Conduct a one-way ANOVA test on the data. What's the F statistic? So take the data, open it in StatCrunch. All right, and then you just go stat, ANOVA. You were probably staring at it waiting for this day, huh? One way. And then you want to select all the columns. So I just click and then shift highlighting down everything, compute, and there it is. So let's scoot this over. So F is equal to, here's my F statistic right there. And they want us to round to two decimal places. So that would be 7.28, yes? 
Well done, thank you. Determine the p-value, it's right here, 0 0.0027, rounded to three decimal places, that's 0 0.003, well done. And then we're gonna make our decision. So they said the significance level was 1%, that's 0 0.01, p-value is less than alpha, which means we reject the null. The data provides sufficient evidence to conclude that the population means are not all the same. I mean, I would say that's a given. We know people are not paying equal rent in the four regions of the US. Okay, so that's it. The rest of the homework is pretty straightforward. Oh, I did wanna show you how to play around with the degrees of freedom and get a critical value. Where was it? Ah, this one. No, we did this one. Ah, yes, here. So an F curve has degrees of freedom 12 and 20. Use an F distribution table to find the F value that has an area of 0 0.012. It's right. I mean, no, you can open the distribution or obviously we're just going to go into start crunch. And then this time you're going to go to your calculators. So stat and then you go calculators down to F and 0 0.01 is the area to the right. So I'm going to say X is greater than some number and the area is the probability. So this needs to be 0 0.01 and they told me degrees of freedom are 12 and 20. Okay, did I hit standard? Yeah, we're good. So that means rounded to two decimal places right here. That is the F value. So 3.23, nice work. And then they want us to choose the correct graph. I mean, I don't see hardly anything shaded in tiny, tiny little thing. It's gonna be this one. Fantastic. So that's it. I mean, that's as wild as things are going to get. Thank you guys for a great semester. I hope you enjoyed the course. Stay tuned too. If you need any other math classes, I have so many videos on my YouTube channel, Math TV with Professor V. So subscribe. I'll put the link in the description and information on that if you need algebra, pre-calculus, Calc 123, you name it. I got a lot of stuff there. So I wish you guys lots of success. Hope the final goes well. And Talk to you guys soon.